Hi folks, we just got our ST20Y, but a friend reached out and needed some turning work done really quickly out of some D2 tool steel. I actually thought, hey, this is a perfect example, a relatively simple part for us to cut our teeth, learn this machine, and make a few bucks. And it turns out to be a great video to show what we learned in getting this machine set up, how we run it, and some of the processes that we go through from the Fusion 360 cam side, from how we handle quality control, measuring, checking, even using Microsoft Excel a little bit as part of that workflow. So let's dive in. The first thing that I found is critical to running a shop is having a portable desk. This lets me wheel my desk anywhere in the shop. I can go into a quiet spot to take a phone call or a meeting, or I can move it right over here. So I've got my home base, the computer that I have set up with my tools and my resources to program this part, troubleshoot, dial it in, makes it really nice. Now we've got a dual spindle lathe, and that's absolutely something I'm really excited about taking advantage of. But for these parts, we're only making use of the main spindle card here to our video talking about the basics of a modern turning center and how we tooled up this machine. So like I said, we're in the middle of running this job. I'm ready for the next part. We've got our stop gauge set. This lets me open up the chuck. I like to pull the bar out further than we need. We can lay our stop on here so we can hold it there, close the part up, and it doesn't move. One of the other things that I'm absolutely loving about this machine is it's got the built-in tool probe arm and it's automatic. So we're using these VBMT inserts for our finishing pass. So I really care about the tolerance of this insert and the finished part. So if I rotate or replace the insert, it's going to be different, but not that much. What the Haas control lets us do is let's say I've just rotated that insert. I go into edit, turning tools, automatic mode it knows the tool you have called up and it remembers the last xy offset so all i have to do is hit cycle start it's going to lower the tool arm probe it's going to jog that tool over to the the probe tip and it's going to retouch off the exact location of that insert giving you absolutely awesome tolerances so with that let's hit cycle start let's start running these parts and while those are running we're going to show how we handle our fusion 360 cam workflow not only for this part but for any lathe part that comes in it's a way that gives us really really quick cam for quoting as well as a really good starting point for how we program the parts for feeds and speeds for our tool libraries as well as our whole lathe setup we're QCing every part that comes off so we've got a set of zero to ones and a set of one to two mics these are the Michitoyu Quantum mics, which are absolutely amazing. They're buttery smooth and they have a much steeper pitch screw, which makes them easy to adjust different diameters. This lets us check the major outside dimensions on these parts. And then I've got our set of gauge pins here, which act as a go no go gauge. But the tolerances on these turn parts were very strange. So let's show how I used Excel to give us a process that any of us could follow without having to think and make sure we didn't make any mistakes. The tolerances on this part, they were metric and we generally work in inches. But the real issue is that all of the tolerances are negative. Building this Excel sheet only took a few minutes and it gives us a process. So if we take this 24.8 millimeter dimension here, we converted that over to inches and the largest that we could make that feature was two thousandths of an inch under or 0 0.05 millimeters. And the smallest that we could make it was just about five thou under. So it was a bit strange for us to have a feature or a part where the dimension given wasn't an acceptable outcome. Both had to be negative. I've got the listed dimension here that lets us tie it back to the print. And then I've got the high and the low range. So as a part comes off, I'll just type in 0 0.973 and you'll see our outcome change from a fail to a within. So if our part was say 970, it would say fail. So how do you get Excel to do that? Equals if, so an if statement just says, if something happens, what do you want to happen? So if the test, if this value, G7, so it's the value where we tested in, is less than our initial range, so that's the, this value here, then say true, now notice I had to put true in quotes. That's because Excel normally likes to work with numbers. And here I just want a text outcome. So putting it in quotes just tells Excel write or output, whatever you put in quotes. And if that's not true, we'll say fail. Now that worked, but that only gave us the low range. The way we check to see if our number's within both is with an and statement. So we'll say equals if and this number is less than our low range, comma, and 
that's where the and comes in. This number is greater than our high range, then pass, otherwise fail. So if we type in a what would be an acceptable range, it passes. Card here to download this so that you can just copy and paste it or repurpose to use as you see fit. And this could be a really powerful tool whether you're working alone in the shop and you just don't want to make a mistake because you're tired and probably working too late, or if you're building a process for your team. So how do we program this part? Well, we've got a pretty cool workflow that, that we've built and has been inspired by Rob Lockwood's method uh, that he showed at Autodesk University. Card here to our page where you can watch some of the really good AU classes that we saw this year. And it all goes back to having a master template. Now, if you use templates in Fusion 360, those can be helpful, but not nearly as good as this type of a template, which is really totally different. What we've got in this master template file are a few key things. We've got our work holding, we've got our stock, and we've got a part placeholder component. So I'm gonna activate that part placeholder component. I'm gonna right click on the part we've gotta make, or just even quote, and say, insert into current design. Now it brings the part in and it's not correctly oriented. I'm not even gonna worry about that. Click OK, hit J on your keyboard for joint, and I'm gonna join the tip of our part to the origin I already have made on our stock. And if you notice, we look at it from a side view, that origin is slightly behind the edge of our stock. And this makes sure we're always gonna be facing off a clean part. So a couple problems, our stock isn't wide enough or long enough. So I've got the change parameters menu at the top. If you don't have that there, click on modify. It'll be at the bottom of your modify list. If you use it a lot like we do, you can click on those three dots and pin it to your toolbar. This opens up the user parameters for our stock diameter and our stock length. I know I've got two and a half inch stock. That gives me enough diameter and the length is somewhat arbitrary. We're starting with about 50 inch long sticks that we're feeding through our spindle liner. The question really here is how much do we need protruding from the face of our Royal Collet? So let's say 3.8 inches, that's too much. We'll say 3.5. That should be plenty to get a parting tool between the backside of the part and the face of our collet. The nice thing though is if we wanna change that later, we can change it and there won't be any need to reprogram our part. But here's where this workflow really shines. Our cam is almost already done. Because many of the turning features in Fusion 360 are model aware, it already recognizes our part and it has started applying the facing operation, the roughing, the rest machining roughing, finishing strategies, and even grooving. Now we do have some cleanup to do, but it's such a quicker workflow and Without doing anything, I can already tell my cycle time will approximately be about six minutes. Ends up it's about two minutes less than that, but with only a few clicks, I've gotten a really good idea. Now, again, we're brand new to this machine. We've just been refining this. Right now, these speeds and feeds are set up for aluminum, but the beauty of this master template file is we'll be building this out to where we'll have setups for both steel and aluminum and maybe additional materials that mean we can drop it in and automatically be applying the right speeds and feeds and the right tools for that material. We aren't drilling anything, so I can delete that. We aren't threading anything, I can delete that. Single grooves. So this part has some sharp inside corners and our finishing insert still has a very small corner radius. So what we're gonna use is our sharp groove tool to come in here and pick a few points that will let us clean up that sharp inside corner. And for our grooving, I don't want the groove tool to come all the way back here. I wanna sandwich it between these two flanges. So I'll edit this. I'll choose my front as this flange and I'll choose my back as that flange. The last thing I'll cover that has been an absolute game changer for us is NC programs. NC programs save a ton of time and hassle factor. Take a look. I can choose what number I want. We're using the 7000 series for our lathe work. I can choose the output folder. We use a shared network drive. That way we don't have to use thumb drives or sneaker nets to load our files. And I can set the post 
to the one I want. And equally important, something I really care about when we're using larger diameter steel is the max spindle speed. You can set that in individual cam operations, but there's a chance it gets wiped out or overridden. I don't want this lathe to ever turn too fast when I've got this heavy bar. So we're gonna set that at 1800 RPMs, and I have a lot of confidence that because it's happening at the post level, it will correctly set the max spindle speed. Under operations, I've got everything selected here, but the beauty of NC programs is you can create different NC programs to post the operations you need. So let's say you've got a complex part that's gonna go between two or three machines. Well, NC programs will let you create a NC program for the fixturing and a separate NC program for the turning and a separate NC program for the five axis work. The correct operations are always selected, the correct post process are selected, along with your preferential settings. Things like G187 are set correctly. And when you're ready to post, right click, post process, you're done. Now, if you're overwriting a file, you'll see you'll get a pop-up warning, but click yes. No more scrolling through settings, trying to find the right post processor, select, reselecting the correct output folder, checking the file name, it's phenomenal.